Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the inversion of our true myths. My guest is Dr. Betty Kovacs, who taught literature, writing, and symbolic mythic language for 25 years. She has served as chair and program chair on the board of directors of the Jung Society in Claremont, California. She sits on the academic advisory board of the Forever Family Foundation. Dr. Kovacs is author of Merchants of Light, The Consciousness That Is Changing the World. Uh, that book is, was the winner of the Scientific and Medical Network 2019 Book Prize. It also won a Nautilus Silver Award. In addition, she has also written The Miracle of Death. There is nothing but life. This is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Betty. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. <laughs> so, we're going to be exploring this notion that there is uh, are true myths as opposed to myths that have been inverted. And uh, you seem to have identified uh, across global civilization examples of this true myth that uh, seem pretty clear to you because of your study of mythic and symbolic language. Yes, and I taught myth and uh, symbolic language as well as fairy tale and other other types of symbolic literature. And I I read Carl Jung. <laughs> I think he was very important in my life when I was uh, in college. I discovered him and began to read him, and I paid attention to my dreams and his significance in my life. In in one great sense was that. I came to realize from what I had studied and from the teaching and from my own inner experiences that uh, there was, as he said, an organizing principle within the human psyche that we don't just make up myths. Uh, they don't, you know, they're, they're not fiction. <laughs> it's something that we experience. And around the world, people have experienced uh, stories, they may be very different in many ways, but they will follow this organizing principle, uh, principles of organization. And those principles guide us and direct our growth and our evolution. And so we can recognize these stories all around the world. And thank heavens, we can then recognize when they have been distorted and inverted. And it's very easy to see what the purpose is for that distortion. It's usually for power over others. Now, one of the myths that you uh, highlight as an example of a true myth is, is the idea of the tree of life. Yes. Yes, that is a dominant symbol worldwide. It's uh, rooted in the earth. Its branches reach to the heavens. And so it has, it actually is in existence in all three dimensions, you might say, the, the deep world, the time of uh, the world of time and space, and also the invisible world of spirit. And so that it's been very significant to people all over the world. And of course, I, even as a child, when I heard the tree of life story that we received from Genesis, I thought it was a very strange story. And I couldn't figure it out, but it wasn't the kind of thing that concerned me deeply as a child. But of course, as I grew older, I knew that the story of the tree and the Garden of Eden and a god, a male god only, the female was missing, and two people, uh, that this story was, was very distorted and very troublesome. Um, and should I go into the story? <laughs> Let me uh, step back for just a moment because you mentioned the three worlds. You talked about the invisible world, the, the human world, and the deep world, as if I recall correctly. And I, I just want to make sure I understand the distinction, for example, between the deep world and the invisible world. 
Well, actually, there may not be. It depends upon how they're used. Uh, shamans often think of the underworld as a place of darkness and death, uh, but it just is equally a place of light and birth and rebirth. So it really, it depends upon how it's used. In human terms, we could think of it as the unconscious of all of those aspects of ourselves that we are unconscious of and therefore don't really bring into use in our world uh, unless they decide to come on their own. <laughs> and that very often happened. Jerry Jung used to say that if we uh, ignore the unconscious, if we ignore the inner life, it will present itself in time and space in the outer world. It's probably easier uh, to just think of the visible and the invisible world. And and all of the rest is that darkness of not knowing. In other words, one might say the invisible world is, is filled with darkness and light. Yes. So, uh, back to the uh, myth of the tree of life, you point out that it actually originates in, uh, I think, in ancient Sumerian culture. And probably even earlier, um, the Egyptian culture is just filled with uh, beautiful images of the tree of life and the goddess uh, who's really... Uh, the serpent, you might say, she and the serpent are one. They are kundalini energy, but her, her very essence is the tree. And in so many of the uh, paintings of the tree and the goddess, she is actually giving uh, liquid to drink to either the soul or the person or both. So she really gives others her essence. It has always been the role of the feminine to give the fruit from the tree of life, because she is soul, she's heart, uh, spirit, and she always wants to feed anyone who is ready to receive it. And it is her essence of soul that she gives. It was quite a contrast to the story in Genesis where the fruits of the tree of life are forbidden. Absolutely. It's, it's a tragic story. And... Uh, Margaret Barker has done incredible research with First Temple uh, Judaism and then the appearance of the Deuteronomist. And the Deuteronomist wrote that story, but it was a rewriting of it. And I tell about in the book how uh, in 621 under Josiah, uh, the First Temple traditions were destroyed. The feminine was seen as in Egypt, as the soul, as the essence of divinity. And she gave of herself always and gave the fruit so others would know who they are. But she, all of her trees, the tree was sacred to her and her sacred groves were burned. And every object of her out in nature or in the temple uh, was destroyed. And the sacred wisdom literature was destroyed, although there were Jews who did not approve of this change at all. And they took much of the sacred literature to Egypt, and so much of it has survived. Uh, but many of the Jews were very uh, uh, upset with the destruction of the first temple spiritual tradition, which Margaret Barker shows was a shamanic mystic tradition and that was destroyed and when it was destroyed her images were in the tree would be one of them so it was absolutely distorted and twisted into what we have in genesis in, in other words uh some sort of uh power struggle took place and and as a result of that power struggle uh you could say the goddess was suppressed, and this occurred not only in uh, the Near East, but I, I gather it's occurred around the world. Yes, yes, that's true. And I focus just on uh, Western culture and those uh, cultures that so uh, influenced Western tradition uh, and destroyed it, one might say. <laughs> Western tradition is built on the inverted myths but yes, there was a power struggle. You know, we were told, of course, by the Deuteronomist in Genesis that uh, that this was God 
telling Adam and Eve that they here they were in a beautiful place in Eden and they could eat any fruit that they wanted, but they could not eat of this one tree. And that was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, and of course, that was exactly the opposite. Of course, if we don't know who we are, we can be controlled. So, and, and it was this, uh, they were punished for eating it and with fear, the same thing any, uh, dictator wants. It was just fear and punishment. And that's exactly what these Deuteronomists talked about that God, uh, punished them and made them very, very fearful. And it's, they they were cast out of of the garden and an angel was there with a sword to be sure they did not come back in because god did not want them to eat of the tree of life and discover that they were in fact immortal like the gods so we can see from every aspect of that story exactly what our true myth was because each one of it was each truth of the true myth was negated by the deuteronomist so you know i i grew up in the jewish faith and i recall uh, learning uh, somewhere along the line that uh, the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth of the five books of Moses, was discovered during the reign of King Josiah, but that the previous books ha- were already known. And I think what you're saying is that actually during the reign of Josiah, th- those previous books were rewritten or reassembled or maybe even written for the first time. It looks that way. Now, I didn't know what you just said. I've always just read that the Deuteronomist, you know, entered into history at that time. No one really knew who they were and that they wrote all of the books. Um, and it, it doesn't seem that the people who followed uh, the ancient tradition or the first temple tradition uh knew about earlier books. It seemed it all came on the scene in 621, but maybe I'm wrong about that. You know, I might not have known. Of course, it was not long after that that you had the Babylonian exile. You had uh, the prophet Ezra, who who is really credited with assembling the the Jewish Bible, the five books of Moses, uh, and, and bringing it back to Israel uh, from Babylon or from Persia, actually, under the reign of uh, the the Persian emperors. So th- they may have also had something to do with it. But uh, interesting to me, there's a Kabbalistic legend ab- about this, which I think is relevant, which is that uh, Moses, it said, when he went up to Mount Sinai to receive the law from God, was given what they called the Torah of the Tree of Life. And according to this legend, when when he came down from the mountain and saw the uh, Jews uh, at the base of the mountain worshiping the golden calf, he got angry and he smashed the Torah of the Tree of Life carved in stone and the letters flew back up to heaven. And at that point, M- Moses had to go back up the mountain and come back with a second Torah, that which they call the Torah of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is the Torah that was received. So uh, the sense is that, that the Kabbalistic mystics understood that there was an original Torah prior to the one that uh, was finally uh, received from Moses. That is a beautiful story, which I've not heard. And I have read in several places that, yes, uh, the Kabbalist or many of the priests uh, after the first temple uh, tradition was destroyed, and then when they went to Babylon, that they continued to work on that tradition. And it, it seems, of course, Kabbalism is one of these ancient traditions, the Jewish tradition that kept alive these universal organizing principles that were known. And, and Kabbalism teaches those principles. And that's such an interesting story that, uh, uh, Moses had to, had to go back and get another one. And Margaret Barker says Moses doesn't even exist in any of the literature before the exile. That there might have been that that story, uh, the story of Moses what might have been told for various reasons to, to, uh, unite the Jews, to, uh, to help them after the exile. So I don't know. I don't know. But that Kabbalistic story is, is very, very interesting and in line with, 
with the history that we now know. Well, I've often thought uh, to myself that the the Jewish religion took a wrong turn when it came to Moses. So uh, I'm I'm I'm, sh- I'm sure you're onto something. But what what we seem to be highlighting here is that there's uh, been an esoteric tradition going back to what we could call the Tree of Life, and it can be found throughout the world. But it's always been kind of set in opposition to exoteric culture. Yes, except it seems uh, that in the early phases of our development, that that was a natural way to go. And I looked at the cave cultures and also the sand bushmen in the Kalahari Desert. And in the cave cultures, I think it's finally realized that they were a shaman mystic tradition. Uh, and it was fought over for years and years. But I think now with uh, David Lewis Williams, who's a, an archaeologist, and Jean-Claude wrote a book about the shamanistic tradition within the cave cultures. And they were very uh, devoted, you might say, to experiencing something beyond time and space. And the rituals that early people did, we now know that they actually create and created at that time, but they do if we do them now, created a slow brain wave that tends to organize the various components of the brain. Um, they probably didn't know it in that sense, but ritual was very, very important from the very beginning because it changed the brain. It changed what was happening and our ability to perceive. And so the various rituals in the cave cultures uh, certainly uh, were shamanic. We can be quite sure in Lascaux, in the deep, deepest, almost like a pit, we see the shamanic uh, etchings on stone of the bison that is dying, uh, the shaman who is lying down, he has an erection, and the staff with a bird on it. Now, all of these elements are part of shamanic culture, is that the dying animal gives energy to the shaman to go in to an altered state of consciousness, to visit the invisible world. The staff with the bird is a typical shaman symbol because he will fly into another world. So we know that they were uh, shamans who had experiences of altered states. And uh, then in the Sandbushmen, they say that they have been doing this for 60,000 years. We only know archaeologically that they were late, uh, later than the uh, cave cultures, but they could have been going on simultaneously. And I think that we probably will discover that. In fact, they might be the origin of the cave cultures of that knowledge. But nothing is more important for the Bushmen to, to be in touch with soul to be in touch with the invisible world. And they actually do experience very advanced states of consciousness in which they themselves call cosmic consciousness. And I wouldn't know that if it weren't for the work of uh, Bradford and Hilary Keeney, who've written about them. And uh, Keeney uh, went uh, to visit them. But as a young man, when he was playing the piano, he had an experience of really, we have to call it cosmic consciousness that lasted several hours and then through the night. And he didn't know what to do with it, but it was just filled with love and ecstasy and the joy of being alive. And so he didn't talk about it, but he went to college and then uh, at Purdue, I think, and MIT, was teaching at a university and was invited to South Africa to a university to teach. And two weeks before he left, he was told uh, he had a dream in which he was told that he should go see uh, the sand bushman. And there was a map even in his dream telling him exactly where to go. So when he was in South Africa, he did indeed uh, get a team and go to that place. And as he was crossing the desert, the uh, bushmen were running toward him and they said, welcome home. We've been waiting for you. So for over 20 years, he studied with them on and off. He'd go back and forth 
And they trusted him so much. They said he had achieved the highest states that they knew how to achieve, which was cosmic consciousness. And they gave him their sacred teachings to be published. Throughout the world, one of the key features of these true myths, these sacred teachings, is that uh, we are not just mortals. We don't just die like we see animals dying, that, that the human soul is uh, has an immortal aspect to it. As Goethe called it, the holy open secret. You could tell people that the secret could be told, but it would still be a secret because they knew that we had to experience it before we really knew it. And so with all of the mystery schools and, and the ancient world, that was an effort to create circumstances in which an individual would see uh, that he or she was a part of this vast universe, almost like a holograph. It's almost like they understood that. And that we don't, the consciousness does not die. That was one of the major aspects of this uh, secret, you might say, that our ancestors wanted us to know. And of course, at Eleusis in Greece, uh, there was a uh, sacred medicine was used to assure that everyone had that experience. So there were those who wanted us to know the truth about who we are and those who did everything they could to distort that knowledge and prevent us from knowing who we are so they could control us. This idea of the inversion of the true myth uh, is sort of built into nature itself that, that uh, maybe the best way I could express it is, you know, all children around the world play this game of hide and seek. And I think, uh, in, in a sense, we're playing this game with ourselves. The idea is to get so lost in the physical world that, that we forget who we really are. And then the na nature of the game is to find our way back. <laughs> That's really, I like that a lot. And thinking about that, I mean, the first years of my life where I was so happy, I had a brother and we lived in the country, we played all the time. And I can remember one of our favorite games was, and I don't know how it got started, uh, was what if there wasn't a world? Except we'd close our eyes, we'd squint, and we'd say, what if there wasn't a world, wasn't a world? And we'd just keep doing that. And I remember that I'd get to a point in which I really thought there was nothing. But at that very moment, the whole world came uh, just flowing back into me. And, it, and later when I realized that, you know, our ancestors were saying that being comes from non-being, but the moment you touch death, just as Persephone in the myth in Greece, the moment death touches her, she conceives of new life. And uh, certainly uh, our myths tell us that, but just naturally in childhood games, I think we do perceive it too. I love the hide and seek. We've just hidden so deeply we can't find ourselves very well now. And, and there's also, to me, this notion I, of the Hegelian dialectic, that every thesis engenders its own antithesis. Oh, so, yeah. so so the sacred truths of, of our immortality, or at least our, that we partake of a much larger consciousness than uh, what we think of as, as our human animal consciousness, uh, that, that that is naturally going to uh, engender uh, the opposite thought sooner or later. Yes. yes, yes. Well, and being in time and space is being in a world of opposites. And how do we find the truth in each and bring them in, as Goethe said, uh, that, that the two will move into the third, the third unknown and h highly developed uh, possession of the opposites. It's a unity of opposites. And I think that's what we're always doing, trying to do that. So we go through the, the polarities and then find a third, much higher level where they're unified. In your work, you describe the, uh, I think you consider this sort of the ideal model as the, the, the shaman mystic scientist. All three of those motifs combined into uh, one and that, that this uh, arises from time to time in human culture. Yes. Yes. I think that the, the shaman mystic experienced the universe and 
there was just one step to try to understand it conceptually. And that's where the scientist steps in. And it uh, was a very powerful uh, story for me to read about that in 1600, there were many people who were working very uh, intently to experience the invisible world, to have altered states of consciousness, and also to study those from a conceptual scientific perspective. And at that time, there were engineers and mathematicians and people who were really exploring the world in every way they knew how to do. And they finally got power in 16, uh, can't remember whether it was around 1620, but only for a winter has, did they have that power. But they really had the goal of bringing together this knowledge, which would show how we are one and every religion should understand that there is one reality and we may experience it from different perceptions. And that's what they had hoped for, but that was not the last. Uh, the Catholics and the Habsburgs got together and destroyed them and uh, it destroyed even many of the text. And after that, there was a 30 years war and it was just a devastation in Europe. And when the Royal Society of Science developed in the 1600s, after that event, no scientist was going to touch anything but the material world. And But the scientists had been a natural part uh, the megalithic builders in the early after the cave cultures, they had geometry as the one basic uh, way of looking at the world. They understood it and they seemed to understand uh, how the human being was really a mediator between the invisible and the visible world. And their structures were to assist in that mediation. So it just was... A natural, a natural outgrowth of experiencing altered states of consciousness that the scientific mind would be ignited. Now, we talked about the tree of life. Another one of the symbols that you, you point out to as uh, related to our true myths, as you describe them, would be the labyrinth. Well, the earliest labyrinth was found about 24,000 BCE, carved on stone, I think it was stone, it might have been another object. And then in the Neolithic period, let's say from 6,000, it usually starts around 8,000, but at least from 6,000 BCE, there are many objects uh, with the labyrinth either etched on it or painted on it. It's on dancing floors, it was danced, it was on t in temples, on stone, it was everywhere. And it was uh, a symbol of the journey that we take as human beings, as you say, since we've hidden from ourselves, let's find ourselves. So this was uh, a symbol of finding, of finally asking the question and going on the journey. What's it all about anyway? So we start with the labyrinth and we walk in a circular way and go down, down, down to the deepest part of ourselves, which would be the center of the labyrinth. And I love how Carl Kerenyi, who is a classicist, said, described it. He said, and at the center, we confront the divine, the cosmic mind, not as other, but as self. That's beautifully put. And and I guess also you, you relate the labyrinth to these ancient uh, cave cultures. Well, you know, it it does. Uh, Seems so. The very, uh, cave itself is a labyrinth. Uh, I visited several of the caves in France and the Dordogne Valley and, and going through them, you would think if you are there crawling through, walking through, having to get through a very small space and then get to another place, you think, oh, I'm here and then you're not, is that it's like a labyrinth because it's darkness. It's very symbolic of walking in darkness until you get to the center. And then when you do finally get to the place where the ritual is to occur very often, and they may also have used sacred plants. There's some evidence of that, uh, even that early, that they had this incredible vision. And, of course, we don't have any uh, material from them, any text or written language, but we know that the shaman experience would be to experience this wholeness, 
this unity of all life and that they were the animals they were hunting, they were the arrows, they were the cave, they realized they were everything all all together in one. It was a unity. Um, so I think in that sense it is because they had to crawl in very uncomfortable uh, spaces in order to get to that place where the vision occurred. I had the sense visiting the pyramids in Egypt that they were also designed in a similar way more to me as chambers of initiation rather than as tombs. You know, that makes sense to me. I've, I've never been in Egypt. And I sometimes when I look at all of the temples and the paintings and I try to visualize what it would be like to be there. But, uh, that, that could be because the painting certainly on the walls has to do uh, with the journey through darkness into light, into initiation. And, you know, Jeremy Nadler's work on the uh, schematic uh, text in, in the uh, pyramids, that this is exactly what was going on with that major ritual of Osiris meeting uh, Horus. Horus would be the one from here who's going to Osiris. And that incredible uh, meeting, as he says, the fusion of both minds, of both life and death. And that was the essential, uh, most important uh, ritual for the Egyptians is to fuse the mind here in matter with the Osirian mind in spirit. Otherwise, the earth could not prosper. We could not live unless we were in contact with the invisible world. What you're saying here uh, reminds me, uh, takes me back to the Deuteronomist, because uh, the idea of the fusion of life and death is pretty much the opposite of what is said in the book of Deuteronomy, where I I believe it, it says something like this, I have set before you both life and death. Now the choice is yours. Choose life. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a strange, uh, state of mind uh, that the Deuteronomists reflect uh, in, in the shamanic tradition or in all of the underground traditions that carry that uh, way of thinking. Uh, it's just the opposite. It's that they are, life includes both. <laughs> and we need to fuse the mind with both before we can live fully in time and space. Betty, when we were talking about the tension between esoteric culture and exoteric culture, you you referred to, if, if I remember right, the 16th century and a, a group of esotericists who achieved power briefly. Uh, but if I remember right, you didn't identify who they were. Was that the Knights Templars you were uh, describing? Oh, well, no, they were another group, but this was... Um a group of people uh, in Germany, actually, uh, but they were connected uh, to such people who were uh, visionaries and mystics and scientists in England. So there was a movement, it was around the 1600s, a tremendous movement of awakening, you might say, between England and Germany and uh, into uh, oh, the old Bohemia in Czechoslovakia, where the Catholic Rudolf was in control, but he was very interested in all these things, and he allowed all of the underground groups, the Kabbalists, the alchemists, uh, and the mystic Christians, all of them, to be together in uh, Bohemia. And so uh, this was a very exciting period in which they were coming together and really discovering things about themselves, about the universe, and about nature in a scientific way. And uh, and and then two people, it was the daughter from the king in England, uh, with uh, the prince in Heidelberg, married, and they went to Bohemia when Rudolf died, and they actually had power for about a winter, I think. But uh, the church wasn't going to allow that, nor the state. And they uh, they were removed from any kind of power. And as I said, the text in Heidelberg were thrown in the street, 
uh, destroyed, maybe some taken to the Vatican. But this was again another time when, when there was a terrible, uh, loss of intellectual life as well as spiritual experience. People were killed even. I mean, Giordano Bruno was killed not long before that. I mean, it was just impossible to see the universe in any way that was not limited by the church's vision. It strikes me that we may be in a similar era now ourselves, though, where more and more people, like the 76,000 people who are now subscribers to uh, the New Thinking Aloud video channel, are, are coming to an awareness of the necessity for integrating uh, the, the mystical, the shamanistic, and the scientific aspects of our own consciousness. Oh, absolutely. And that's wonderful. 76,000. Yes, I think this is an incredible time of awakening. And at the same time that we are awakening, we have to see what has been done by this darkness, this unconsciousness, this repression of what we could have been and what we can be. And uh, in the last chapter, or the conclusion, I think it is, of the book, I talk about that, that, that this darkness has to surface uh, for us to really see what we have done in the past. What has this limitation, this censorship, this uh, total distortion of who we are by religious systems, uh, and I'm especially referring to the Roman Church, uh, that we have to know that. We have to know what harm we have done to ourselves and the earth. For instance, in the Deuteronomist myth of the tree, uh, God actually... Uh, curses the earth so that Adam will have to suffer all of his life and trying to get uh, life out of it. And in such a sacred act as having a child, he actually curses childbirth so that the woman will suffer. But I, I can't help thinking how much harm have we done to the earth because we no longer saw the earth as sacred. Our ancestors saw the earth as sacred, and wanted to understand the principles, the organizing principles of nature, of life. And they knew that those principles and the principles organizing their lives needed to be in harmony. They they had wonderful rituals uh, honoring the earth, loving the earth. Uh, and when God cursed the earth, what does that do? I mean, we've thought of in our history, uh, if it just is dead matter and exploit it, get what you can out of it. Or the old uh, <laughs> image of put her on the rack and uh, torture her until she releases her secrets. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that image came from Francis Bacon, as I recall, who was also regarded as as a great esoteric uh, writer. So it, it seems as if sometimes, uh, well, this might be an example of light and darkness getting confused within one individual. Yes, and I I wonder what it really did to the people after sixteen twenty. Uh, how how frightened were those who had been a part of that movement when they sort of tucked tail and went back to their home countries and tried to sort of lie low and not let anyone know they'd ever been a part of that movement? Um, I wonder what kind of damage that really did to, to our ability to think freely. Uh, we couldn't share it with each other. Uh, it's a terrible damage done. Uh, and I, I can't... I wish we knew more about the Deuteronomist because to have God tell us that to dust you will return, you are from the dust and you will return to dust. It just seems like such a horrific thing to say to someone, but it certainly was to try to get us to know that we're nothing. And that had to do terrible damage when it's given in the name of God and then it's in our sacred texts. As I recall, you quote some other scholars who, who say there were two primary myths in uh, early humanity, in the most ancient cultures. Uh, I, I believe they were the myth of meaning, finding meaning, which would be a, a myth of mystical awareness, but also the myth of the hunter. That is, in addition to our mystical uh, awareness, we had to hunt for food. 
Yes. Yes. That was, uh, uh, Anne Baring and Jules, uh, what was Jules' name? Uh, the woman she wrote the book with, they wrote about the myth of meaning and the myth of survival and that we do have to survive. And that can lead us <laughs> completely into a hiding position, which we can't remember anything else. Uh, but if we are connected, first of all, to that, the deep myths of meaning, then we will have always, when we have that, the myth of survival also is within that larger myth. But when we leave the myth of meaning, we go into uh, a state of not remembering who we are. And so the myth of survival isn't connected anymore. But if we have a myth of meaning, then our survival will be within that myth. And I thought that was really brilliant that the two of them, Cashford was her name, Jules Cashford, uh, that, uh, and that's exactly true with the Sam Bushman is that they dance, they have a dance for everything. Uh, how I wish that we did that. You know, we would, we usually feel quite uncomfortable with dance, but everything that happened, the birth of a child, even the sun coming back in the morning, everything was such a phenomenal, beautiful happening in their lives. And they were such joyful people, evidently. And so they would, they said that they had a dance for everything, but the big dance was the dance for meaning for the longing for that deep meaning in the universe to keep that vision, to hold that vision so that their lives would be balanced and, and filled with joy, no matter what was happening to them. And they certainly have been a, a culture that has, as one person put it, a murdered culture. Uh, it was, it was, I think it was in the 1930s that uh, the government of South Africa still sold licenses to hunters to go kill them. So little did we understand. <laughs> the value of human life. The real tragedy of humanity is that we often put the, the this notion of survival uh, ahead of meaning, that, that we throw meaning to the wayside in order to pursue our survival needs. Oh, I absolutely agree that, and in our culture, how we survive, our colleges train us in our profession how to survive, but we have no training for how to to create meaning in our lives. It's as though, you know, that so many people just believe that, that uh, the future happens to them. They have nothing to do with it without realizing that we are co-creating our future. Betty, I understand that an important part of your personal journey uh, resulted from tragedy, really, having your mother, your your son, and your husband all killed within a few years uh, as a result of automobile accidents, that that really spurred your quest to find meaning. You know, I think all my life I had looked for something. Was there meaning in the universe? Uh, is there a purpose to our lives? Uh, could there be anything? Even as a child, well, as a young child, I had a wonderful time. But then when I started becoming a little bit conscious, I, my brother and I would go to the church, find a church wherever we moved that had a good children's program. And I was a part of that. But I, even then I wondered, could it really be so? And then I'd say to myself, well, people, you know, people have believed it so long. It must be. But, uh, I had no way of experiencing it because the Christian church, uh, got rid of all of the techniques for experiencing, uh, in the invisible world. But I, I always, even by grade school, I kept thinking something's missing. And I think, is it water? No, it's not water. And so I spent most of my life looking for meaning. That's why I taught mythology and fairy tale and theory of myth and symbol. And I'd find in these myths that there was always a larger consciousness possible. And I used to say to my students, well, this is in the myths around the world. I think that we can put some uh, credence in it. But I have not experienced that. Well, I went to Peru twice uh, to work with shamans. And I did have some unusual experiences, but when I came home, I really started uh, working uh, with shamanic techniques. But it was when our son died that uh, that other world opened up to us. Um, and my husband wasn't 
interested in altered states of consciousness we had in the early years, but he got swallowed up with his profession. And my profession became looking for that meaning. But um, he had a vision of Pishti's, our son's death, uh, uh, before. It happened about two weeks before. He saw his car on the freeway and he saw Pishti's body superimposed on that. Uh, and he thought to himself when he saw that, oh, it's almost time for you to do that. And then that shocked him so much that then he, but he did hear Pishti say, that's right, dad. I'll be out of the house for a little while. When I looked back, I had dreams, even when I was pregnant, that his life would be short, but I tried to look at it in many different ways. So we had many, I had many dreams. Ishvan had that one uh, vision before his death, but it was with his death and and the visions that we had uh, after his memorial, it really began a week after his death, that totally changed my husband. And I remember him sitting on the side of the bed after his first vision with Pishti, and he said, I had no idea what you were talking about, and I will never look at the world in the same way again. So we had many visions with Pishti that changed us both totally. So that was, uh, I, I certainly never had any question about uh, death again. I knew that consciousness definitely su- survives and continues to create. And one of the things that Pishti wanted us to know is that, to remember that, but also uh, to know what is going what is going on in the, in the world. He said the next 20 or 30 years is one of the most important times for the earth. And he wanted us to to remember, his way he put it, what the earth is going to go through because she is attempting, we are attempting to bring into light the harm, the the decayed structures that we've lived with and transform it so that we will actually create a new consciousness that is much more highly developed, that this is how he saw what we're going through. Your writing, the, the book Merchants of Light, uh, was was inspired by these communications. Yes, yes, uh, very much so. Uh, although it's based on the study that I did all the time I was teaching and then after I retired, but, uh, Istvan had a vision, uh, about the decayed in our world, uh, and the jackal, the Anubis, uh, in the form of the jackal was one of the major images that I had just before Pishti died. And then Istvan had in a vision and about, it, eating the decayed food and transforming it into within his own body. So certainly a major uh, theme of our experiences was uh, looking at what's decayed, what is no longer fruitful for any of us, knowing it, understanding it, and transforming it into uh, a life-giving mythology, for example, or understanding. Uh, so in that same vision, Pishti said, Dad, uh, look up, in the I Ching, this hexagram, and he told him that it was straight, broken, broken, straight, straight, broken. So when Ishvan was no longer in the vision, he uh, said to me, do we, we still have the I Ching, don't we? And I said, yes, but I'll have to go get it. So I had to look for it for a while in this study. And I found it and I ran back. And so I looked in the back of the book to see what those lines, what that hexagram would be. And then when I opened it, it was the hexagram 18, work on what has decayed. So it was very connected to Pishti's vision for sure. Uh, and that seems to be maybe the message uh, for humanity at large. At this point in our history, so much has decayed, so much has gone wrong for so long, for so many centuries, that uh, the, the time really has come. If we're going to ever have a, a rebirth of our civilization, it needs to work on what has decayed and and to look deep into the labyrinths of our own mind to to find it all. Exactly. That's exactly the point. It's when we look back in in our country, for example, at a time when very few Americans knew what the United States was doing internationally that was very harmful to other people. Uh, I now I think uh, young people understand that far better than than I did when I was young. And as I became aware of that, it was 
it was so deeply disturbing, but I realized that I had to know. I had to know politically and I had to know spiritually what we had done to ourselves uh, because otherwise we can't change it. Well, that's an important message uh, to leave with our viewers. Uh, Betty Kovacs, this has been a, a very heartfelt and important discussion. Thank you so much for being with me. Mm, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.